Chapter thirty three of Historical Tales, Volume seven, Spanish, by Charles Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three The Fall of a Favorite. The course of our work now brings us down to recent times. After the death of Philip the Second in fifteen ninety eight, Spain had little history worth considering. Ruled by a succession of painfully weak kings, who were devoid of anything approaching political wisdom, the fortunes of the realm ran steadily downward. From being the strongest it became in time one of the weakest and least considered of European kingdoms, and from taking the lead in the politics and wars of Europe it came to be a plaything of the neighboring nations, a cat's paw which they used for the advancement of their own ends. It was in this way that Napoleon treated Spain. He played with it as a cat plays with a mouse, and when the proper time came, pounced upon it and gathered it in. Charles the Fourth, the Spanish king of Napoleon's time, was one of the feeblest of his weak line, an imbecile whom the emperor of France counted no more than a feather in his path. He sought to deal with him as he had done with the equally effeminate king of Portugal. When a French army invaded Portugal in 1807, its weak monarch cut the knot of the difficulty by taking ship and crossing the ocean to Brazil, abandoning his old kingdom and setting up a new one in the new world. When Spain was in its turn invaded, its king proposed to do the same thing, to carry the royal court of Spain to America and leave a kingdom without a head to Napoleon. Such an act would have exactly suited the purposes of the astute conqueror, but the people rose in riot and Charles IV remained at home. The real ruler of Spain at that time was a licentious and insolent favorite of the king and queen, Emmanuel Godoy by name, who began life as a soldier, was made Duke of Alcudia by his royal patrons, and was appointed prime minister in 1792. In 1795, having made peace with France after a disastrous war, he received the title of Prince of the Peace. His administration was very corrupt, and he won the hatred of the nobles, the people, and the heir to the throne but his influence over the imbecile king and the licentious queen was unbounded, and he could afford to laugh in the face of his foes. But favorites are apt to have a short period of power, and though Godoy remained long in office, his downfall at length came. Napoleon had marched his armies through Spain to the conquest of Portugal, no one in Spain having the courage to object. It was stipulated that a second French army should not cross the Pyrenees, but in defiance of this, Napoleon filled the north of Spain with his troops in 1808, and sent a third army across the mountains without pretense of their being needed in Portugal. No protest was made against this invasion of a neutral nation. The court of Madrid was helpless with terror, and, with the hope of propitiating Napoleon, admitted his legions into all the cities of Catalonia, Biscay, and Navarre. Only one thing more was needed, to make the French masters of the whole country. They held the towns, but the citadels were in possession of Spanish troops. These could not be expelled by violence while the show of peace was kept up, but Napoleon wanted them, and employed stratagem to get them into his hands. In two of the towns, San Sebastian and Figueras, a simple lie sufficed. The officers in command of the French garrisons asked permission to quarter their unruly conscripts in the citadels. As the court had ordered that all the wishes of the emperor's officers should be gratified, this seemingly innocent request was granted. But in place of conscripts, the best men of the regiments were sent, and these were gradually increased in numbers until in the end they overpowered the Spanish garrisons and admitted the French. At Pamplona, a similar request was refused by the governor of the citadel, but he permitted sixty unarmed men daily to enter the fortress to receive rations for their respective divisions. Here was the fatal entering wedge. One night, the officer in charge, whose quarters were near the citadel gate, secretly filled his house with armed grenadiers. The next morning, sixty picked men, with arms hidden under their cloaks, were sent in for rations. The hour was too early, and the French soldiers loitered about under pretense of waiting for the quartermaster. Some sauntered into the Spanish guardhouse. Others, by a sportive scuffle on the drawbridge, prevented its being raised, and occupied the attention of the garrison. Suddenly a signal was given. The men drew their weapons and seized the arms of the Spaniards. The grenadiers rushed from their concealment, the bridge and gate were secured, French troops hastened to the aid of their comrades, and the citadel was won. At Barcelona a different stratagem was employed. A review of the French forces was held under the walls of the citadel, whose garrison assembled to look on. 
During the progress of the review, the French general, on pretense that he had been ordered from the city, rode with his staff onto the drawbridge with the ostensible purpose of bidding farewell to the Spanish commander. While the Spaniards curiously watched the maneuvers of the troops, others of the French quietly gathered on the drawbridge. At a signal this was seized, a rush took place, and the citadel of Barcelona was added to the conquests of France. The surprise of these fortresses produced an immense sensation in Spain. That country had sunk into a condition of pitiable weakness. Its navy, once powerful, was now reduced to a small number of ships, few of them in condition for service. Its army, once the strongest in Europe, was now but a handful of poorly equipped and half-drilled men. Its finances were in a state of frightful disorganization. The government of a brainless king, a dissolute queen, and an incapable favorite had brought Spain into a condition in which she dared not raise a hand to resist the ambitious French emperor. In this dilemma, Godoy, the so-called Prince of the Peace, persuaded the king and queen of Spain that nothing was left them but flight. The royal house of Portugal had found a great imperial realm awaiting it in America. Spain possessed there a dominion of continental extent. What better could they do than remove to the new world the seat of their throne and cut loose from their threatened and distracted realm? The project was concealed under the form of a journey to Andalusia, for the purpose, as announced by Godoy, of inspecting the ports. But the extensive preparations of the court for this journey aroused a suspicion of its true purpose among the people, whose indignation became extreme on finding that they were to be deserted by the royal house as Portugal had been. The exasperation of all classes, the nobility, the middle class, and the people, against the court grew intense. It was particularly developed in the army, a body which Godoy had badly treated. The army leaders argued that they had better welcome the French than permit this disgrace, and that it was their duty to prevent by force the flight of the king. But all this did not deter the prince of the peace. He had several frigates made ready in the port of Cadiz. The royal carriages were ordered to be in readiness, and relays of horses were provided on the road. The date of departure was fixed for the 15th or 16th of March, 1808. On the 13th, Godoy made his way from Madrid to Aranjuez, a magnificent royal residence on the banks of the Tagus, then occupied by the royal family. This residence, in the Italian style, and surrounded by superb grounds and gardens, was fronted by a wide highway, expanding opposite the palace into a spacious place, on which were several fine mansions belonging to courtiers and ministers, one of the finest being occupied by the prime minister. In the vicinity, a multitude of small houses, inhabited by tradesmen and shopkeepers, made up the town of Aranjuez. Godoy, on arriving at Aranjuez, summoned a council of the ministers, this time, having arrived to apprise them of what was proposed. One of them, the Marquis of Caballero, kept him waiting, and on his arrival refused to consent, either by word or signature, to the flight of the king. "'I order you to sign,' the Prime Minister angrily exclaimed. "'I take no orders except from the king,' haughtily replied the Marquis." A sharp altercation followed, in which the other prime ministers took part, and the meeting broke up in disorder, nothing being done. On retiring, the irate councillors, full of agitation, dropped words which were caught up by the public, and aroused a commotion that quickly spread throughout the town. Thence it extended into the surrounding country, everywhere arousing the disaffected, and soon strange and sinister faces appeared in the quiet town. The elements of a popular outbreak were gathering. During the succeeding two days, the altercation between the Prince of the Peace and the ministers continued, and the public excitement was added to by words attributed to Ferdinand, the king's son and heir to the throne, who was said to have sought aid against those who proposed to carry him off against his will. On the morning of the 16th, the final day fixed for the journey, the public agitation was so great that the king issued a proclamation, which was posted in the streets, saying that he had no thought of leaving his people. It ended... Spaniards, be easy, your king will not leave you. This, for the time, calmed the people, yet on the 17th the excitement reappeared. The carriages remained loaded in the palace courtyard, the relays of horses were kept up, all the indications were suspicious. During the day, the troops of the garrison of Madrid not on duty, with a large number of the populace, appeared in Aranjuez, having marched a distance of seven or eight leagues.' 
They shouted maledictions on their way against the queen and the prince of the peace. The streets of Aranjuez that night were filled with an excited mob, many of them life guards from Madrid, who divided into bands and patrolled the vicinity of the palace, determined that no one should leave. About midnight an incident changed the excitement into a riot. A lady left Godoy's residence under escort of a few soldiers. She appeared to be about to enter a carriage. The crowd pressed closely around, and the hussars of the minister, who attended the lady, attempted to force a passage through them. At this moment a gun was fired, by whom was not known. A frightful tumult at once arose. The lifeguards and other soldiers rushed upon the hussars, and a furious mob gathered around the palace, shouting, Long live the king! Death to the prince of the peace! Soon a rush was made toward the residence of the prince, which the throng surrounded, gazing at it with eyes of anger, yet hesitating to make an attack. As they paused in doubt, a messenger from the palace approached the mansion and sought admission. It was refused from those within. He insisted upon entrance, and a shot came from the guards within. In an instant all hesitation was at an end. The crowd rushed in fury against the doors, broke them in, and swarmed into the building, driving the guards back in dismay. It was magnificently furnished, but their passion to destroy soon made havoc of its furniture and decorations. Pictures, hangings, costly articles of use and ornament were torn down, dashed to pieces, flung from the windows. The mob ran from room to room, destroying everything of value they met, and eagerly seeking the object of their hatred, with a passionate thirst for his life. The whole night was spent in the search, and the prince not being found, his house was reduced to a wreck. Word of what was taking place filled the weak soul of Charles the Fourth with mortal terror. The prince failed to appear, and by the advice of the ministers, a decree was issued by the king on the following morning, depriving Emmanuel Godoy of the offices of Grand Admiral and Generalissimo, and exiling him from the court. Thus fell this detestable favorite, the people, who blamed him for the degradation of Spain, breaking into a passionate joy, singing, dancing, building bonfires, and giving every manifestation of delight. In Madrid, when the news reached there, the enthusiasm approached delirium. Meanwhile, where was the fallen favorite? Despite the close search made by the mob, he remained concealed in his residence. Alarmed by the crash of the breaking doors, he had seized a pistol and a handful of gold, rushed upstairs, and hid himself in a loft under the roof, rolling himself up in a sort of rush carpet used in Spain. Here he remained during the whole of the eighteenth and the succeeding night, but on the morning of the nineteenth, after thirty-six hours' suffering, thirst and hunger forced him to leave his retreat. He presented himself suddenly before a sentry on duty in the palace, offering him his gold but the man refused the bribe and instantly called the guard. Fortunately, the mass of the people were not near by. Some lifeguards, who just then came up, placed the miserable captive between their horses and conveyed him as rapidly as they could toward their barracks. But these were at some distance. The news of the capture spread like wildfire, and they had not gone far before the mob began to gather around them, their hearts full of murderous rage. The prince was on foot between two of the mounted guardsmen, leaning for shelter against the pommels of their saddles. Others of the horsemen closed up in front and rear, and did their best to protect him from the fury of the rabble, who struck wildly at him with every weapon they had been able to snatch up. Despite the efforts of the guardsmen, some of the blows reached him, and he was finally brought to the barracks with his feet trodden by the horses, a large wound in his thigh, and one eye nearly out of his head. Here he was thrown, covered with blood, upon the straw in the stables, a sad example of what comes of the favor of kings when exercised in defiance of the will of the people. Godoy had begun life as a life guardsman, and now, after almost sharing the throne, he had thus returned to the barracks and the straw bed of his youth. We may give in outline the remainder of the story of this fallen favorite. Promise being given that he should have an impartial trial, the mob ceased its efforts to kill him. Napoleon, who had use for him, now came to his rescue, and induced him to sign a deed under which Charles the Fourth abdicated the throne in favor of his son. His possessions in Spain were confiscated, but Charles, who removed to Rome, was his friend during life. After the death of his protector he went to Paris, where he received a pension from Louis-Philippe, and in 1847, when eighty years of age, he received permission to return to Spain, his titles and most of his property being restored.' 
but he preferred to live in Paris, where he died in 1851. End of chapter 33《Chapter thirty four of Historical Tales, Volume seven, Spanish, by Charles Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty four The Siege of Saragossa. On the banks of the Ebro in northwestern Spain stands the ancient city of Saragossa, formerly the capital of Aragon, and a place of fame since early Roman days. A noble bridge of seven arches, built nearly five centuries ago, crosses the stream, and a wealth of towers and spires gives the city an imposing appearance. This city is famous for its sieges, of which a celebrated one took place in the twelfth century, when the Christians held it in siege for five years, ending in 1118. In the end the Moors were forced to surrender, or such of them as survived, for a great part of them had died of hunger. In modern times it gained new and high honor from its celebrated resistance to the French in 1808. It is this siege with which we are now concerned, one almost without parallel in history. We have told in the preceding tale how Charles IV of Spain was forced to yield his throne to his son Ferdinand, who was proclaimed king March 20, 1808. This act by no means agreed with the views of Napoleon, who had plans of his own for Spain, and who sought to end the difficulty by deposing the Bourbon royal family and placing his own brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne. The imperious emperor of the French had, however, the people as well as the rulers of Spain to deal with. The news of his arbitrary action was received throughout the peninsula with intense indignation, and suddenly the land blazed into insurrection and the French garrisons, which had been treacherously introduced into Spain, found themselves besieged. Everywhere the peasants seized arms and took to the field, and a fierce guerrilla warfare began, which the French found it no easy matter to overcome. At Bailen, a town of Andalusia, which was besieged by the insurgents, the French suffered a serious defeat, an army of 18,000 men being forced to surrender as prisoners of war. This was the only important success of the Spanish, but they courageously resisted their foes, and at Saragossa gained an honor unsurpassed in the history of Spain. Never had there been known such a siege and such a defense. Saragossa was attacked by General Lefebvre on June 15, 1808. Thinking that a city protected only by a low brick wall, with peasants and townsmen for its defenders, and a few guns in condition for service, could be carried at first assault, the French general made a vigorous attack, but found himself driven back. He had but four or five thousand men, while the town had fifty thousand inhabitants, the commander of the garrison being Joseph Palafox, a man of indomitable spirit. Lefebvre, perceiving that he had been overconfident, now encamped and awaited reinforcements, which arrived on the twenty-ninth, increasing his force to twelve thousand men. He was recalled for service elsewhere, General Verdier being left in command, and during the succeeding two months the siege was vigorously prosecuted, the French being supplied with a large siege train with which they hotly bombarded the city. Weak as were the walls of Saragossa, interiorly it was remarkably well adapted for defense. The houses were strongly built of incombustible material, they being usually of two stories, each story vaulted and practically fireproof. Every house had its garrison, and the massive convents, which rose like castles within the circuit of the wall, were filled with armed men. Usually, when the walls of a city are taken, the city falls, but this was by no means the case with Saragossa. The loss of its walls was but the beginning, not the end of its defense. Each convent, each house, formed a separate fortress. The walls were loopholed for musketry, ramparts were constructed of sandbags, and beams were raised endwise against the houses to afford shelter from shells. It was not until August that the French, now fifteen thousand strong, were able to force their way into the city. But to enter the city was not to capture it. They had to fight their way from street to street and from house to house. At length the assailants penetrated to the Casso, a public walk formed on the line of the old Moorish ramparts, but here their advance was checked, the citizens defending themselves with the most desperate and unyielding energy. The singular feature of this defense was that the woman of Saragossa took as active a part in it as the men. The Countess Burita, 
a beautiful young woman of intrepid spirit, took the lead in forming her fellow women into companies, and whose head were ladies of the highest rank. These, undeterred by the hottest fire, and freely braving wounds and death, carried provisions to the combatants, removed the wounded to the hospitals, and were everywhere active in deeds of mercy and daring. One of them, a young woman of low rank but intrepid soul, gained worldwide celebrity by an act of unusual courage and presence of mind. While engaged one day in her regular duty, that of carrying meat and wine to the defenders of a battery, she found it deserted and the guns abandoned. The French fire had proved so murderous that the men had shrunk back in mortal dread. Snatching a match from the hand of a dead artilleryman, the brave girl fired his gun and vowed that she would never leave it while a Frenchman remained in Saragossa. Her daring shamed the men, who returned to their guns, but as the story goes, the brave girl kept her vow, working the gun she had chosen, until she had the joy to see the French in full retreat. This took place on the 14th of August, when the populace, expecting nothing but to die amid the ruins of their houses, beheld with delight the enemy in full retreat. The obstinate resistance of the people, and reverses to the arms of France elsewhere, had forced them to raise the siege. The deeds of the Maid of Saragossa have been celebrated in poetry by Byron and Southey, and in art by Wilkie, and she stands high on the roll of heroic women, being given, as some declare, a more elevated position than her exploit deserved. Saragossa, however, was only reprieved, not abandoned. The French found themselves too busily occupied elsewhere to attend to this centre of Spanish valour until months had passed. At length, after the defeat and retreat of Sir John Moore and the English allies of Spain, a powerful army, thirty-five thousand strong, returned to the city on the Ebro with a battering train of sixty guns. Palafox remained in command in the city, which was now much more strongly fortified and better prepared for defence. The garrison was superabundant. From the field of battle at Tudela, where the Spaniards had suffered a severe defeat, a stream of soldiers fled to Saragossa, bringing with them wagons and military stores in abundance. As the fugitives passed, the villagers along the road, moved by terror, joined them, and into the gates of the city poured a flood of soldiers, camp followers, and peasants, until it was thronged with human beings. Last of all came the French, reaching the city on the 20th of December, and resuming their interrupted siege. And now Saragossa, though destined to fall, was to cover itself with undying glory. The townsmen, giving up every thought of personal property, devoted all their goods, their houses, and their persons to the war, mingling with the soldiers and the peasants to form one great garrison for the fortress into which the whole city was transformed. In all quarters of the city, massive churches and convents rose like citadels, the various large streets running into the broad avenue called the Coso, and dividing the city into a number of districts, each with its large and massive structures well capable of defence. Not only these thick-walled buildings, but all the houses, were converted into forts, the doors and windows being built up, the fronts loopholed, and openings for communication broken through the party walls, while the streets were defended by trenches and earthen ramparts mounted with cannon. Never before was there such an instance of a whole city converted into a fortress, the thickness of the ramparts being here practically measured by the whole width of the city. Saragossa had been a royal depot for saltpetre, and powder mills nearby had taught many of its people the process of manufacture, so no magazines of powder subject to explosion were provided, this indispensable substance being made as it was needed. Outside the walls the trees were cut down and the houses demolished, so that they might not shield the enemy. The public magazines contained six months' provisions, the convents and houses were well stocked, and every preparation was made for a long siege and a vigorous defence. Again, as before, companies of women were enrolled to attend the wounded in the hospitals and carry food and ammunition to the men, the Countess Burita being once more their commander, and performing her important duty with a heroism and high intelligence worthy of the utmost praise. Not less than fifty thousand combatants within the walls faced the thirty-five thousand French soldiers without, who had before them the gigantic task of overcoming a city in which every dwelling was a fort and every family a garrison. A month and more passed before the walls were taken, 
Steadily the French guns played on these defences, breach after breach was made, a number of the encircling convents were entered and held, and by the 1st of February the walls and outer strongholds of the city were lost. Ordinarily, under such circumstances, the city would have fallen, but here the work of the assailants had but fairly begun. The inner defences, the houses with their unyielding garrisons, stood intact, and a terrible task still faced the French. The war was now in the city streets. The houses nearest the posts held by the enemy were crowded with defenders. In every quarter the alarm bells called the citizens to their duty. New barricades rose in the streets, mines were sunk in the open spaces, and the internal passages from house to house were increased, until the whole city formed a vast labyrinth, throughout which the defenders could move under cover. Marshal Lannes, the French commander, viewed with dread and doubt the scene before him. Untrained in the art of war, as were the bulk of the defenders, courage and passionate patriotism made up for all deficiencies. Men like these, heedless of death in their determined defense, were dangerous to meet in open battle, and the prudent Frenchman resolved to employ the slow but surer process of excavating a passage and fighting his way through house after house, until the city should be taken piecemeal. Mining through the houses was not sufficient. The greater streets divided the city into a number of smaller districts, the group of dwellings in each of which forming a separate stronghold. To cross these streets it was necessary to construct underground galleries, or build traverses, since a Spanish battery raked each street, and each house had to be fought for and taken separately. While the Spaniards held the convents and churches, the capture of the houses by the French was of little service to them the defenders making sudden and successful sallies from these strong buildings, and countermining their enemies, their numbers and perseverance often frustrating the superior skill of the French. The latter, therefore, directed their attacks upon these buildings, mining and destroying many of them. On the other hand, the defenders saturated with rosin and pitch the timbers of the buildings they could no longer hold, and interposed a barrier of fire between themselves and their assailants, which often delayed them for several days. Step by step, inch by inch, the French made their way forward, complete destruction alone enabling them to advance. The fighting was incessant. The explosion of mines, the crash of falling buildings, the roar of cannon and musketry, the shouts of the combatants continually filled the air, while a cloud of smoke and dust hung constantly over the city as the terrible scene of warfare continued day after day. By the 17th of February, the Casso was reached and passed but the French soldiers had become deeply discouraged by their fifty days of unremitting labor and battle, fighting above and beneath the earth, facing an enemy as bold as themselves and much more numerous, and with half the city still to be conquered. Only the obstinate determination of Marshal Lannes kept them to their work. By his orders, a general assault was made on the 18th. Under the university, a large building in the Cosso, mines containing three thousand pounds of powder were exploded the walls falling with a terrific crash. Meanwhile, fifty pieces of artillery were playing on the side of the Ebro, where the great convent of Saint-Lazare was breached and taken, two thousand men being here cut off from the city. On the 19th other mines were exploded, and on the 20th six great mines under the Cosso, loaded with thousands of pounds of powder, whose explosion would have caused immense destruction, were ready for the match, when an offer to surrender brought the terrible struggle to an end. The case had become one of surrender or death. The bombardment, incessant since the 10th of January, had forced the women and children into the vaults, which were abundant in Saragossa. There, the closeness of the air, the constant burning of oil, and the general unsanitary conditions had given rise to a pestilence which threatened to carry off all the inhabitants of the city. Such was the state of the atmosphere that slight wounds became fatal, and many of the defenders of the barricades were fit only for the hospitals. By the 1st of February, the death rate had become enormous. The daily deaths numbered nearly 500, and thousands of corpses, which it was impossible to bury, lay in the streets and houses and in heaps at the doors of the churches, infecting the air with their decay. The French held the suburbs, most of the wall, and one-fourth of the houses, while the bursting of thousands of shells and the explosion of nearly 50,000 pounds of gunpowder in mines had shaken the city to its foundations. Of the hundred thousand people who had gathered within its walls, more than fifty thousand were dead. Thousands of others would soon follow them to their grave. Palafox, their indomitable chief, was sick unto death, 
Yet despite this there was a strong and energetic party who wished to protract the siege, and the deputies appointed to arrange terms of surrender were in peril of their lives. The terms granted were that the garrison should march out with the honors of war, to be taken as prisoners to France. The peasants should be sent to their homes, the rights of property and exercise of religion should be guaranteed. Thus ended one of the most remarkable sieges on record. Remarkable alike for the energy and persistence of the attack, and the courage and obstinacy of the defense. Never in all history has any other city stood out so long after its walls had fallen. Rarely has any city been so adapted to a protracted defense. Had not its houses been nearly incombustible, it would have been reduced to ashes by the bombardment. Had not its churches and convents possessed the strength of forts, it must have quickly yielded. Had not the people been animated by an extraordinary enthusiasm, in which women did the work of men, a host of peasants and citizens could not so long have endured the terrors of assault on the one hand, and of pestilence on the other. In the words of General Napier, the historian of the Peninsular War, when the other events of the Spanish War shall be lost in the obscurity of time, or only traced by disconnected fragments, the story of Zaragoza, like some ancient triumphal pillar standing amidst ruins, will tell a tale of past glory. End of chapter 34「Chapter thirty five of Historical Tales, Volume seven, Spanish, by Charles Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty five The Hero of the Carlists Spain for years past has had its double king a king in possession and a king in exile, a holder of the throne and an aspirant to the throne. For the greater part of a century one has rarely heard of Spain without hearing of the Carlists, for continually since eighteen thirty there has been a princely claimant named Charles, or Don Carlos, struggling for the crown. Ferdinand VII, who succeeded to the throne on the abdication of Charles IV in 1808, made every effort to obtain an heir. Three wives he had without a child, and his brother Don Carlos naturally hoped to succeed him. But the persistent king married a fourth time, and this time a daughter was born to him. There was a law excluding females from the throne, but this law had been abrogated by Ferdinand to please his wife and thus the birth of his daughter robbed Don Carlos of his hopes of becoming king. Ferdinand died in 1833, and the infant Isabella was proclaimed queen, with her mother as regent. The liberals supported her, the absolutists gathered around Don Carlos, and for years there was a bitter struggle in Spain, the strength of the Carlists being in the Basque provinces and Spanish Navarre, a land of mountaineers loyal in nature and conservative by habit. The dynasty of the Pretender has had three successive claimants to the throne. The first Don Carlos abdicated in 1844, and was succeeded by Don Carlos II, his son. He died in 1861, and his cousin, Don Carlos III, succeeded to the claim, and renewed the struggle for the crown. It was this third of the name that threatened to renew the insurrection during the Spanish-American War of 1898. This explanation is necessary to make clear what is known by Carlism in Spain. Many as have been the Carlist insurrections, they have had but one leader of ability, one man capable of bringing them success. This was the famous Basque chieftain Zuma la Caregui, the renowned Uncle Tomas of the Carlists, whose brilliant career alone breaks the dull monotony of Spanish history in the nineteenth century, and who would in all probability have replaced Don Carlos on the throne, but for his death from a mortal wound in 1835. Since then, Carlism has struggled on with little hope of success. Navarre, the chief seat of the insurrection, borders on the chain of the Pyrenees, and is a wild confusion of mountains and hills, where the traveller is confused in a labyrinth of long and narrow valleys, deep glens, and rugged rocks and cliffs. The mountains are highest in the north, but nowhere can horsemen proceed the day through without dismounting, and in many localities even foot travel is very difficult. In passing from village to village, long and winding roads must be traversed, the short cuts across the mountains being such as only a goat or a navarese can tread. Regular troops, in traversing this rugged country, are exhausted by the shortest marches, 
while the people of the region go straight through wood and ravine, plunging into the thick forests and following narrow paths through which pursuit is impossible, and where an invading force does not dare to send out detachments, for fear of having them cut off by a sudden guerrilla attack. It was here, and in the Basque provinces to the west, with their population of hardy and daring mountaineers, that the troops of Napoleon found themselves most annoyed by the bold guerrilla chiefs, and here the Carlist forces long defied the armies of the crown. Tomas Zumalacregui, the modern Cid, as his chief historian entitles him, was a man of high military genius, rigid in discipline, skillful in administration, and daring in leadership a stern, grave soldier, to whose face a smile rarely came except when shots were falling or thick around him, and when his staff appeared as if they would have preferred music of a different kind. To this intrepid chief fear seemed unknown, prudence in battle unthought of, and so many were his acts of rashness that when a bullet at length reached him, it seemed a miracle that he had escaped so long. The white charger which he rode became such a mark for the enemy, from its frequent appearance at the head of a charging troop, or in rallying a body of skirmishers, that all those of a similar colour ridden by members of his staff were successively shot, though his always escaped. On more than one occasion he brought victory out of doubt, or saved his little army in retreat, by an act of hare-brained bravery. Such was the Uncle Tomas of the Navarrese the darling of the mountaineers, the man who had a very likely brought final victory to their cause, had not death cut him off in the midst of his career. Few were the adherents of Don Carlos when this able soldier placed himself at their head, a feeble remnant hunted like a band of robbers among their native mountains. When he appeared in 1833, escaping from Madrid, where he was known as a brave soldier and an opponent of the Queen, he found but the fragment of an insurgent army in Navarre. All he could gather under his banner were about eight hundred half-armed and undisciplined men, a sorry show with which to face an army of over one hundred and twenty thousand men, many of them veterans of the recent wars. These were thrown in successive waves against Uncle Tomas and his handful of followers, reinforcement following reinforcement, general succeeding general, even the redoubtable Mina among them, each with a new plan to crush the Carlist chief, yet each disastrously failing. Beginning with eight hundred badly armed peasants and fourteen horses, the gallant leader had at the time of his death a force of twenty-eight thousand well-organized and disciplined infantry and eight hundred horsemen, with twenty-eight pieces of artillery and twelve thousand spare muskets, all won by his good sword from the foe, his arsenal being, as he expressed it, in the ranks of the enemy. During these two years of incessant war more than fifty thousand of the army of Spain, including a very large number of officers, had fallen in Navarre. Sixteen fortified places had been taken, and the cause of Don Carlos was advancing by leaps and bounds. The road to Madrid lay open to the Carlist hero when, at the siege of Bilboa, a distant and nearly spent shot struck him, inflicting a wound from which he soon died. With the fall of Zumala Caregui, fell the Carlist cause. Weak hands seized the helm from which his strong one had been struck. Incompetence succeeded genius, and three years more of a weakening struggle brought the contest to an end. In all later revivals of the insurrection it has never gained a hopeful stand, and with the fall of Uncle Tomas the Carlist claim to the throne seemingly received its death-blow. The events of the war between the Navarrese and their opponents were so numerous that it is not easy to select one of special interest from the mass. We shall therefore speak only of the final incidents of Zumul Caregui's career. Among the later events was the siege and capture of Villa Franca. Espartero, the Spanish general, led seven thousand men to the relief of this place, marching them across the mountains on a dark and stormy night with the hope of taking the Carlists by surprise. But Uncle Tomas was not the man to be taken unawares, and reversed the surprise, striking Espartero with a small force in the darkness, and driving back his men in confusion and dismay. Eighteen hundred prisoners were taken, and the general himself narrowly escaped. General Mirasol was taken, with all his staff, in a roadside house, from which he made an undignified escape. He was a small man, and by turning up his embroidered cuffs, 
those being the only marks of the grade of a brigadier general in the Spanish army, he concealed his rank. He told his captors that he was a tambor. In their anxiety to capture officers, the soldiers considered a drummer too small game, and dismissed the general with a sound kick to the custody of those outside. As these had more prisoners than they could well manage, he easily escaped. On learning of the defeat of Espartero, the city surrendered. The news of the fall of Villa Franca had an important effect, the city of Tolosa being abandoned by its garrison, and Borrera surrendered, though it was strongly garrisoned. Here Charles V, as Don Carlos was styled by his party, made a triumphal entry. He was then at the summit of his fortunes and full of aspiring hopes. Ibar was next surrendered, the garrison of Durango fled, and Salvatierra was evacuated. Victory seemed to have perched upon the banners of the Navarrese, town after town falling in rapid succession into their bands, and the crown of Spain appeared likely soon to change hands. Zumala Caregui proposed next to march upon Vitoria, which had been abandoned with the exception of a few battalions, and thence upon the important city of Burjos, where he would either force the enemy to a battle or move forward upon Madrid. So rapid and signal had been his successes that consternation filled the army of the queen, the soldiers being in such terror that little opposition was feared. Bets ran high in the Carlist army that six weeks would see them in Madrid, and any odds could have been had that they would be there within two months. Such was the promising state of affairs when the impolitic interference of Don Carlos led to a turn in the tide of his fortune and the overthrow of his cause. What he wanted most was money. His military chest was empty. In the path of the army lay the rich mercantile city of Bilboa. Its capture would furnish a temporary supply. He insisted that the army, instead of crossing the Ebro and taking full advantage of the panic of the enemy, should attack this place. This Zumala Caregui strongly opposed. "'Can you take it?' asked Carlos. "'I can take it, but it will be at an immense sacrifice, not so much of men as of time, which now is so precious,' was the reply. Don Carlos insisted, and the general, sorely against his will, complied. The movement was not only unwise in itself, it led to an accident that brought to an end all the fair promise of success. The siege was begun. Zumala Caregui, anxious to save time, determined to take the place by storm as soon as a practicable breach should be made, and on the morning of the day he had fixed for the assault, he, with his usual daring, stepped into the balcony of a building not far from the walls to inspect the state of affairs with his glass. On seeing a man thus exposed, evidently a superior officer, to judge from his telescope and the black fur jacket he wore, all the men within that part of the walls opened fire on him. The general soon came out of the balcony limping in a way that at once created alarm, and unable to conceal his lameness, he admitted that he was wounded. A bullet, glancing from one of the bars of the balcony window, had struck him in the calf of the right leg, fracturing the small bone, and dropping two or three inches lower in the flesh. The wound appeared but trifling, the slight hurt of a spent ball, but the surgeons, disputing as to the policy of extracting the ball, did nothing not even dressing the wound till the next morning. It was of slight importance, they said. He would be on horseback within a month, perhaps in two weeks. The wounded man was not so sanguine. The pitcher goes to the well till it breaks at last, he said. Two months more, and I would not have cared for any sort of wound. Those two months might have put Don Carlos on the throne and changed the history of Spain. In eleven days the general was dead, and a change had come over the spirit of affairs. The operations against Bilboa languished, the garrison regained their courage, the plan of storming the place was set aside, the Queen's troops, cheered by tidings of the death of the terrible Zumala Caregui, took heart again and marched to the relief of the city. Their advance ended in the siege being raised, and in the first encounter after the death of their redoubtable chief, the Carlists met with defeat. The decline in the fortunes of Don Carlos had begun. One man had lifted them from the lowest ebb almost to the pinnacle of success. With the fall of Zumala Caregui, Carlism received a death-blow in Spain, for there is little hope that one of this dynasty of claimants will ever reach the throne. End of chapter 35
Chapter thirty six of Historical Tales, Volume seven, Spanish by Charles Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty six Manila and Santiago. The record of Spain has not been glorious at sea. She has but one great victory, that of Lepanto, to offer in evidence against a number of great defeats, such as those of the Armada, Cape St. Vincent, and Trafalgar. In 1898 two more defeats, those of Manila and Santiago, were added to the list, and with an account of these our series of tales from Spanish history may fitly close. Exactly three centuries passed, from the death of Philip II, 1598, to that of the war with the United States, and during that long period the tide of Spanish affairs moved steadily downward. At its beginning Spain exercised a powerful influence over European politics. At its end, she was looked upon with disdainful pity, and had no longer a voice in continental affairs. Such was the inevitable result of the weakness and lack of statesmanship with which the kingdom had been misgoverned during the greater part of this period. In her colonial affairs, Spain had shown herself as intolerant and oppressive as at home. When the other nations of Europe were loosening the reins of their colonial policy, Spain kept hers unyieldingly rigid. Colonial revolution was the result, and she lost all her possessions in America but the islands of Cuba and Puerto Rico. Yet she had learned no lesson, she seemed incapable of profiting by experience, and the old policy of tyranny and rapacity was exercised over those islands until Cuba, the largest of them, was driven into insurrection. In attempting to suppress this insurrection, Spain adopted the cruel methods she had exercised against the Moriscos in the sixteenth century, ignoring the fact that the twentieth century was near its dawn, and that a new standard of humane sympathy and moral obligation had arisen in, in other nations. Her cruelty toward the insurgent Cubans became so intolerable that the great neighboring republic of the United States bade her, in tones of no uncertain meaning, to bring it to an end. In response, Spain adopted her favorite method of procrastination, and the frightful reign of starvation in Cuba was maintained. This was more than the American people could endure, and war was declared. With the cause and the general course of that war our readers are familiar, but it embraced two events of signal significance, the naval contests of the war, which are worth telling again as the most striking occurrences in the recent history of Spain. At early dawn of the 1st of May, 1898, a squadron of United States cruisers appeared before the city of Manila, in the island of Luzon, the largest island of the Philippine archipelago, then a colony of Spain. This squadron, consisting of the cruisers Olympia, Baltimore, Raleigh, and Boston, the gunboats Petrel and Concord, and the dispatch boat McCulloch, had entered the Bay of Manila during the night, passing unhurt the batteries at its mouth, and at daybreak swept in proud array past the city front, seeking the Spanish fleet, which lay in the little battle of Cavite, opening into the larger bay. The Spanish ships consisted of five cruisers and three gunboats, inferior in weight and armament to their enemy, but flanked by shore batteries on each end of the line, and with an exact knowledge of the harbor, while the Americans were ignorant of distances and soundings. These advantages on the side of the Spanish made the two fleets practically equal in strength. The battle about to be fought was one of leading importance in naval affairs. It was the second time in history in which two fleets, built under the new ideas in naval architecture and armament, had met in battle. The result was looked for with intense interest by the world. Commodore Dewey, the commander of the American squadron, remained fully exposed on the bridge of his flagship, the Olympia, as she stood daringly in, followed in line by the Baltimore, Raleigh, Petrel, Concord, and Boston. As they came up, the shore batteries opened fire, followed by the Spanish ships, while two submarine mines exploded before the Olympia tossed a shower of water uselessly into the air. Heedless of all this, the ships continued their course, their guns remaining silent, while the Spanish fire grew continuous. Plunging shells tore up the waters of the bay to right and left, but not a ship was struck, and not a shot came in return from the frowning muzzles of the American guns. The hour of five-thirty had passed, and the sun was pouring its beams brightly over the waters of the bay, when, from the forward turret of the Olympia, boomed a great gun, and an eight-inch shell rushed screaming in towards the Spanish fleet. 
Within ten minutes more, all the ships were in action, and a steady stream of shells were poured upon the Spanish ships. The difference in effect was striking. The American gunners were trained to accurate aiming. The Spanish idea was simply to load and fire. In consequence, few shells from the Spanish guns reached their mark, while few of those from American guns went astray. Soon the fair ships of Spain were frightfully torn and rent, and many of their men stretched in death, while hardly a sign of damage was visible on an American hull. Sweeping down parallel to the Spanish line, and pouring in its fire as it went from a distance of forty-five hundred yards, the American squadron swept round in a long ellipse and sailed back, now bringing its starboard batteries into play. Six times it passed over this course, the last two at the distance of two thousand yards. From the great cannon and from the batteries of smaller, rapid-fire guns, a steady stream of projectiles was hurled inward, frightfully rending the Spanish ships, until, at the end of the evolutions, three of them were burning fiercely, and the others were little more than wrecks. Admiral Montojo's flagship, the Reina Cristina, made a sudden dash from the line in the middle of the combat, with the evident hope of ramming and sinking the Olympia. The attempt was a desperate one, the fire of the entire fleet being concentrated on the single antagonist, until the storm of projectiles grew so terrific that utter annihilation seemed at hand. The Spanish admiral now swung his ship around and started hastily back. Just as she had fairly started in the reverse course, an eight-inch shell from the Olympia struck her fairly in the stern and drove inward through every obstruction, wrecking the aft boiler and blowing up the deck in its explosion. It was a fatal shot. Clouds of white smoke were soon followed by the red glare of flames. For half an hour longer, the crew continued to work their guns. At the end of that time, the fire was the master of the ship. Two torpedo boats came out with the same purpose, and met with the same reception. Such a rain of shell poured on them that they hastily turned and ran back. They had not gone far before one of them, torn by a shell, plunged headlong to the bottom of the bay. The other was beached, her crew flying in terror to the shore. While death and destruction were thus playing havoc with the Spanish ships, the Spanish fire was mainly wasted upon the sea. Shots struck the Olympia, Baltimore, and Boston, but did little damage. One passed just under Commodore Dewey on the bridge, and tore a hole in the deck. One ripped up the main deck of the Baltimore, disabled a six-inch gun, and exploded a box of ammunition, by which eight men were slightly wounded. These were the only men hurt on the American side during the whole battle. At 7.35, Commodore Dewey withdrew his ships that the men might breakfast. The Spanish ships were in a hopeless state. Shortly after eleven, the Americans returned and ranged up again before the ships of Spain, nearly all of which were in flames. For an hour and a quarter longer, the blazing ships were pounded with shot and shell, the Spaniards feebly replying. At the end of that time, the work was at an end, the batteries being silenced, and the ships sunk, their upper works still blazing. Of their crews, nearly a thousand had perished in the fight. Thus ended one of the most remarkable naval battles in history. For more than three hours the American ships had been targets for a hot fire from the Spanish fleet and forts, and during all that time not a man had been killed and not a ship seriously injured. Meanwhile the Spanish fleet had ceased to exist. Its burnt remains lay on the bottom of the bay. The forts had been battered into shapeless heaps of earth, their garrisons killed or put to flight. It was an awful example of the difference between accurate gunnery and firing at random. Two months later, a second example of the same character was made. Spain's finest squadron, consisting of the four first-class armored cruiser Maria Teresa, Vizcaya, Almirante Oquendo, and Cristobal Colón, with two torpedo-boat destroyers, lay in the harbor of Santiago de Cuba, blockaded by a powerful American fleet of battleships and cruisers under Admiral Sampson. They were held in a close trap. The town was being besieged by land. Sampson's fleet far outnumbered them at sea. They must either surrender with the town or take the forlorn hope of escape by flight. The latter was decided upon. On the morning of July 3rd, the lookout on the Brooklyn, Commodore Schley's flagship, reported that a ship was coming out of the harbor. The cloud of moving smoke had been seen at the same instant from the battleship Iowa, and in an instant the Sunday morning calm on these vessels was replaced by intense excitement. 
Masthead signals told the other ships of what was in view. The men rushed in mad haste to quarters. The guns were made ready for service, ammunition was hoisted, coal hurled into the furnaces, and every man on the alert. It was like a man suddenly awoke from a sleep with an alarm cry, at one moment silent and inert, in the next moment thrilling with intense life and activity. This was not a battle, it was a flight in pursuit. The Spaniards, as soon as the harbour was cleared, opened a hot fire on the Brooklyn, their nearest antagonist, which they wished to disable through fear of her superior speed. But their gunnery here was like that at Manila, their shells being wasted through unskilful handling. On the other hand, the fire from the American ships was frightful, precise, and destructive, the fugitive ships being rapidly torn by such a rain of shells as had rarely been seen before. Turning down the coast, the fugitive ships drove onward at their utmost speed. After them came the cruiser Brooklyn and the battleships Texas, Iowa, Oregon, and Indiana, hurling shells from their great guns in their wake. The New York, Admiral Sampson's flagship, was distant several miles up the coast, too far away to take part in the fight. Such a hail of shot, sent with such accurate aim, could not long be endured. The Maria Teresa, Admiral Cervera's flagship, was quickly in flames, while shells were piercing her sides and bursting within. The main steam-pipe was severed, the pump was put out of service, and the captain was killed. Lowering her flag, the vessel headed for shore, where she was quickly beached. The Almirante Oquendo, equally punished, followed the same example, a mass of flames shrouding her as she rushed for the beach. The Vizcaya was the next to succumb, after a futile effort to ram the Brooklyn. One shell from the cruiser went the entire length of her gun-deck, killing or wounding all the men on it. The Oregon was pouring shells into her hull, and she in turn, burning fiercely, was run ashore. She had made a flight of twenty miles. Only one of the Spanish cruisers remained, the Cristobal Colon. She had passed all her consorts, and when the Vizcaya went ashore was six miles ahead of the Brooklyn, and more than seven miles from the Oregon. It looked as if she might escape. But she would have to round Cape Cruz by a long detour, and the Brooklyn was headed straight for the Cape, while the Oregon kept on the Colon's trail. An hour, a second hour, passed. The pursuers were gaining mile by mile. The spurt of speed of the Colon was at an end. One of the great thirteen-inch shells of the Oregon, fired from four miles away, struck the water near the Colon. A second fell beyond her. An eight-inch shell from the Brooklyn pierced her above her armor belt. At one o'clock both ships were pounding away at her, an ineffective fire being returned. At one twenty she hauled down her flag, and like her consorts ran ashore. She had made a run of forty-eight miles. About six hundred men were killed on the Spanish ships. The American loss was one man killed and one wounded. The ships of Spain were blazing wrecks. Those of the United States were none the worse for the fight. It was like the victory at Manila repeated. It resembled the latter in another particular, two torpedo boats taking part in the affair. These were attacked by the Gloucester, a yacht converted into a gunboat, and dealt with so shrewdly that both of them were sunk. The battle ended. Efforts to save on the part of the American ships succeeded the effort to destroy. The Yankee tars showing as much courage and daring in their attempts to rescue the wounded from the decks of the burning ships as they had done in the fight. The ships were blazing fore and aft, their guns were exploding from the heat, at any moment the fire might reach the main magazines. A heavy surf made the work of rescue doubly dangerous, yet no risk could deter the American sailors while the chance to save one of the wounded remained and they made as proud a record on the decks of the burning ships as they had done behind the guns. These two signal victories were the great events of the war. Conjoined with one victory on land, they put an end to the conflict. Without a fleet, and with no means of aiding her Cuban troops, Spain was helpless, and the naval victories at Manila and Santiago, in which one man was killed, virtually settled the question of Cuban independence, and taught the nations of Europe that a new and great naval power had arisen, with which they would have to deal when they next sought to settle the destinies of the world. End of chapter 36 End of Historical Tales, Volume 7, Spanish, by Charles Morris